so I'm just going to make sure. Great. So today's webinar, there will be four different community archives heritage groups speaking about their work and projects. And they all submitted a digital poster for last year cash conference in Galway. And the delegates at the conference voted to find out more about these groups based on the poster they submitted. Now we will be having uh, digital posters at this year's CAJ annual conference, which is going to be on the 19th of July. It's in London, it's at the University College London. And we'd love to see you all there. But if you can't make it, you may want to think about submitting a poster. And that's really easy to do. And we'll put the information in the chat bar. So look out for that. We are delighted to have a BSL interpreters uh, this evening, Yvonne Waddle and Jackie McDonald. And they will be spotlighted throughout the webinar, which means they'll be visible on screen for the entire webinar. And for you to see the BSL interpreters, please go into gallery view, which you can do at the top of your screen. You can press view and press gallery view. If you have any problems, just put something down in the chat room and we'll try and help you at some point and we'll get everyone online. Just a little bit extra um, housekeeping. This is a Zoom meeting format, which will hopefully enable you to fully participate in the chat and discussion. Please do keep your mics off unless you're speaking. Um, so hopefully ensure that we have a smooth running order today. If you would like to have your camera on, that is up to you. But if your internet is unstable and really during the presentations, we ask you to keep your cameras off so we can see the BSL interpreters. So throughout the session, we will um, encourage you to use the chat bar, uh, make any comments you want. Um, other people uh, that are attending the webinar can answer those questions perhaps. Um, that's what it's all about, is uh, making new friends. But after all four presentations, we will have a Q&A and you can ask a question in the chat bar and we can ask, um, uh, ask it for you. But if you would like a BSL interpreter, to ask your question, please just say so in the chat. Just when you put your question up, say you would like to have the BSL interpreter. I think I have maybe covered everything, actually. Um, so I'm just going to crack on here with the uh, first presentation, which is Lillian Lawson, the Secretary of Deaf History Scotland. Uh, the presentation will describe how and why the Deaf History Scotland archive was set up and the challenges of maintaining these archives. Over to you, Lillian. OK, thank you. I'll just share my slides. OK, I hope everyone can see that. You can see me OK. So thank you for the invitation to present tonight. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to tell you more about Deaf History Scotland and our archive. Um, and we're really delighted to be one of the four um, posters that was selected um, and that we have this opportunity just to share more about our work. So um, let me move on to my first slide. Now, Deaf History Scotland was founded in 2008, so 15 years ago. And the reason it was established was because we already have the British Deaf History Society that's based in England. Um, that had already been going for around 15 years. And in discussions with them, they said, you're better to set up your own Scottish branch because um, that would make it easier to have issues around Scottish identity, to fundraise um, for Scottish specific projects. So we agreed to set up our own institution in 2008. And so DHS that we use for short um, is a deaf led charity. Um, the membership are almost exclusively deaf and our aim is to promote and the discovery, the research, the preservation and awareness of the Scottish histories of deaf people, their culture and their language. That's our mission statement really. You can see the three images there that I have on screen. Um, 
The first one um, is that people are looking at photos. Um, deaf people particularly love photographs and being able to, you know, identify people who um, are in these photographs, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. And so often we have to rely on our members for identification of these um, people that are in the historic photographs and um, people who were there on that day. Um, the next image there is a, an image of our archives, just to show you an example of what that looks like. They're based in Edinburgh. And the last picture there um, is our exhibition that we held last year. Um, and we selected certain pieces of our equipment and um, the old aids and support use, uses that people had, like hearing aids and telecoms, um, and we had them as part of our exhibition. Okay. And Scottish Deaf Archives was set up um, with Deaf History Scotland because we wanted to have all the records in one place and to gather all those records and materials from all over Scotland. And our goal really is to have our own museum, an archive, a deaf archive and museum. And that's something we've been working towards for many years and we're still working towards. So from our establishment in 2008, from our first meetings, we asked deaf people, what do you want from us? What do you want Deaf History Scotland to provide? Um, and people have always said they want their own archive and museum. So from day one, um, they didn't want things to be in local museums um, that were nearby. They wanted them to be um, perhaps, you know, in the one place, because at the moment they're quite spread out between the National Museum, um, the National Library of Scotland and other places haven't had space to have our own one. So if we have our own space and our own venue, it would be much more accessible for people to come and access. And they would also have their own ability to see their own archives and, and be in a deaf space. So again, these three images I've got on screen here, um, you've got the first, you know, first savings bank um, image there. That was from 1876. And that was set up by a Glasgow deaf organisation who wanted to encourage deaf people to save up and to keep their savings. And so that started in 1876. Then that middle picture is an ear trumpet. Um, of the type that was used by people who used to sell these on Buchanan Street in Glasgow. And um, that was sold from 1925 until 1937. Um, they were sold in Glasgow. And the last box there that you see, this is our um, first ever auction purchase, actually. Um, this was last year we were bidding for this. Um, it's a pamphlet holder. Um, for churches and you see on the front there it says deaf and dumb mission we don't know which mission this was from we're not able to find out um, exactly we think it's from Kilmarnock we know that the Kilmarnock you know deaf society um, or maybe one of the other ones but we're delighted to have that we saw that in auction we're able to add that to our archives and so the Scottish deaf archives the reasons that we wanted to set the archives up and begin, you know, the collection of these items was because many of the records were already missing and there wasn't any ongoing work to preserve this material. There wasn't one venue, there wasn't a record system. Um, we didn't know what we had, that, you know, things were quite piecemeal. We didn't know where they came from or who they belonged to. And there was no central place um, for those records and, and those details to be held. With more and more deaf schools closing over the years as well, there was a risk of their materials, clothing and records just disappearing. You know, we're also seeing deaf clubs being closed. Um, and so these natural repositories of, in the past started to close. Um, and so we saw the need to have our own collection of archives so that deaf people knew that there was one place that they could come and access that and also that we could accept donations. <coughs> so it's been a slow process over the last 10 years, but we have built up our collection. We have a range of photographs, films, old school uniforms, awards and trophies, um, a real variety of items. And it has been a real challenge for us because it's important to share this for deaf people and for deaf people to see um, the artifacts that we have. We have regular open days and people are able to access the archives and see exactly what's there. Um, to again, give them that confidence that it shows how important it is to look after these donations and that we are looking after them well. 
Um, but when we have deaf schools that close, they don't see the value in any of their artifacts or their items. You know, and our three members recently went to a place and we were so surprised. Um, we were in, it was a storage container. <laughs> and we could see this storage container was full of items from one particular school, uniforms, photographs, paperwork, trophies, silverware, you know, um, glass, everything. It was amazing. It was a storage container full. And when we said, where did you find that? And they said, oh, I just found it. And you say, well, where, where did you find it? That's clearly come from that deaf school. So either the school has dumped it and, you know, someone else has acquired it. And for the past year, we've been in, you know, fights with them to try and get that kind of material back. Because that's clearly a part of our archive so that people could come and see oh, that was my old school and this was the historic trophies. So I think there's concerns that, you know, people who are around when the schools and clubs close don't see the value in these you know precious cultural artifacts likewise for family members who are maybe not deaf either um, and so don't understand the cultural value that's attached to some of these materials so we want to do more promotion so that people are aware of this We are a completely volunteer-led organisation. Um, no one is paid. <laughs> um, we have an executive committee who are all deaf themselves. Um, our chair, our secretary, our treasurer. Um, we're all. We've got a very work hard, work, hard working committee. Um, we have over eighty five members, and it grows every year. And um, we have new members who join every year. And with Deaf History Scotland, we do work with other um, volunteers and other members. The officers put in an awful lot of work to collect. That, that material to preserve that, to do the cataloguing on the material. That's been a huge challenge doing the cataloguing. <laughs> As many of you will know, it's a very slow process. Um, you've probably been through that yourself. And, you know, having had training on that kind of thing, it's a very specialist area. And as volunteers, we maybe not had that training previously to be able to catalogue things accurately. Um, we were successful last year to get a little bit of funding from the National Archives. Um, to do a scoping project. So that was great to have um, that funding. That let us really look at what our goals for the future are, looking at short-term, medium-term and longer-term goals to really focus in our planning. Um, and we do want to have our own archive with museum. That, that really is the goal to establish. That would really help us to um, have that clear goal and be able to apply for further funding. We were hoping to have a cataloguing officer who can teach the volunteers how to do that training, how to do that record keeping, but also that we have um, someone in place to do that initial piece of cataloging work and then train up the volunteers to do that ongoing. Um, and also to have cataloging in a, in a way that is friendly for deaf people and how do we catalog sign language as well, um, some of these challenges. We're now conducting research as well. We also conduct research on next publication. Um, we have published three books um, in the past. Um, you can see the images of two on the screen there. The Glasgow Deaf Heritage Trail was published four years ago now. And the second one there um, was the John Ross Memorial Badminton Club. That was published last year. Um, so we've got two more books in the pipeline. Um, we're hoping to publish one this year and one next year. Um, and again, deaf people like to see um, and read their own history, you know, especially ones that we've got enough photographs of and um, that we can include. We also organise gatherings and quiz nights and quiz events um, specifically related to deaf history. Um, and a lot of deaf people always say that they learn something new at those evenings. Um, our organisation um, also organises heritage tours as well. So we have sign language run um, heritage tours. We're going to have two more um, this year. So it's not only for deaf people who live in Glasgow, but people from all over Scotland or the UK come to the Glasgow Deaf Heritage Tours to learn about the, the Glasgow has such a rich history in terms of deaf people and their heritage and culture and language. It's quite amazing. And we're also fundraising as well. That's another ongoing challenge, um, you know, to go from project to project funding.
And we do have a number of partnerships. I think it's really important that as a charity, we do work with other organisations. Um, one other charity is Deaf Action, where um, we're really grateful to the work with them. That's where our archives are stored at the moment in Edinburgh, in their premises. Originally, we were in Glasgow at Deaf Connections, um, but unfortunately, Deaf Connections went into liquidation in 2019. And so we had to very suddenly, within two, three days, um, we had to get all our archives out and find somewhere else and luckily Deaf Action welcomed us and so we were able to store um, all of our material there and they've been there ever since um, and we really appreciate their support um, from Deaf Action in Edinburgh. Um, they also provide us a venue for our meetings and regular gatherings. They also, Deaf Action run the Edinburgh Deaf Festival last year was its inaugural year and um, that'll be running again this year so we're able to have our own workshops and exhibitions within their Deaf Festival so that's able to help us, you know, raise our profile and sell our books um, and people can purchase things there. The British Deaf Association in Scotland, we have strong links with them as well. Um, we collaborated with them on a project. It was Glasgow City Heritage actually funded um, two tours and workshops to attend deaf schools to teach young deaf children about their deaf heritage and their local heritage. Um, we also held two online events that were very successful. British Deaf History Society um, is another organisation. Um, we often have joint events with. Two years ago, that was very well attended. And again, we're going to have another in Carlisle um, next week, actually. Um, so we're hoping to have a lot of deaf people there. Um, so we do have partnership working and we're able to discuss ideas and, and problems and plans and share that learning with them. We also work with Edinburgh Napier University. They have many of their students who are maybe working on their project related to design or creative design and in terms of exhibition space and information boards. Um, we've worked with them. They've been so helpful to help us with their own exhibitions. Um, and we've also had some funding to be able to work with the National Library of Scotland in researching um, how they catalogue deaf related books or deaf related magazines or artifacts that they have. Um, so Edinburgh Napier University has been a great partnership um, as well. We also work with Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Um, many of their students who are training to become interpreters, we're able to offer them work placements as well. And that way they're able to learn about our history, um, but also it gives them exposure to sign language from native sign language users, so that's able to improve their sign language skills and also help our archives. And then where there's other deaf heritage projects, we would support um, them as well. You know, we don't want to be siloed. <laughs> we are a small charity and we can't afford to do everything. <laughs> so if there's other Scottish deaf charities who are looking at a heritage project and they approach me, we would always seek to collaborate with them and support where we can. You know, whether it's a topic that we um, know a lot about um, or something that we would need to do a bit more research on. For example, Solar Bear had their Solar Flares project. Um, and so we were able to support them with their funding application and be a member of the steering group. Um, I think it's important to have those healthy working relationships with other partnerships. Um, another organisation is the St Vincent Centre for the Deaf in Glasgow. We were able to be on their steering group and support them with their application to research their own deaf heritage. Um, and so that was two years ago, they were successful in getting funding um, for a project researching their specific deaf heritage um, from the, the Catholic St Vincent's Deaf School in Glasgow, um, who use different signs and um, that's still ongoing at the moment. And the last one there you see is the John Ross Memorial Deaf Church. Um, again, that was based in Glasgow. And so they're looking to write a book about their history and have approached us for advice and support on writing a heritage book in terms of how to get funding, how to conduct that research, and also how to prepare to edit that publication. So these are just some examples where we work with other organisations to support their goals related to heritage projects and we recognise how important it is to work together. Now, the Scottish Deaf History Tartan. This was an idea that came up in 2018 
and it was actually a student. Um, you can see there her name is Sylvia Marinas, Kera. She was a student at Heriot Watt University um, as a tactic, as she's a textile student. She was studying textiles, was her degree. And at that time, the BSL Scotland Act had been recently passed. And we wanted something to celebrate the passing of that act. And we thought, well, what colours would it be? And what would we do if we were celebrating a BSL tartan um, and to create a new flag? And so this tartan was actually designed. Um, and you can see there the colours are actually from the sign union flag that was designed by um, a deaf man himself. And so the colours were inspired from that. And the tartan was designed by Sylvia. And it's now the deaf History Scotland tartan. Um, so it's again another source of revenue that we can sell ties and bow ties, braces, kilts, scarves and whatnot with this tartan on. Um, and that's able to bring a little bit of money in. With COVID and the spread of the pandemic two, three years ago, everyone had to wear masks, of course. So we thought, why not create tartan masks in our Deaf History Scotland tartan? <laughs> they, they sold quite well. Um, too. So every little bit helps to fundraise for our funds. And that's me. So you can see more information on our website. Um, our website at the moment is being refurbished, it's been revised, so it's a work in progress. Um, but you can follow us on Facebook, we do regularly post on our Facebook group and we upload old photos and information about events um, and any new publications as well. Anything that we've received, any new donations for the archives, we also post thanks on there and, and share what we've got. So um, I'm sure there'll be questions for me at the end and I'm happy to answer them, but that's it from me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think you're going to stop sharing your screen. That was so interesting. Um, I've actually know a little bit about your archive. Um, but I just don't know if it was open to the public. So that's a question for later, perhaps. Um, but thank you very much. And thank you, Yvonne. Um, we're going to go over to our next speaker, who is Bernie Doherty from uh, Galway Community Archaeology. And she's going to give a brief overview of her role as the Galway County Community Archaeologist um, and how she has assisted communities, groups, societies, educators, government bodies and individuals in the promotion and preservation of the very, very important archaeological sites and monuments in County Galway. Thank you, Bernie. Bernie, we can't hear you. Man, it would help if we unmuted. Thank you. So hello and thanks a million for inviting me to present this evening. Um, Galway Community Archaeology Project is funded by Galway County Council and the Heritage Council. So I work closely with Marie Mannion, the Heritage Officer here in County Galway, and she's basically the backbone to all things heritage here. Um, so thanks to herself, Lorna Elms from the Museum of Country Life, Castlebar, and Dave Collins, Uchtarard, the the Irish Community Archive Network um, is an invaluable resource for communities throughout the country, but especially here in Galway and uh, in Mayo, where it started up. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit of background and, you know, you're not, you know, just to take archaeology into context. So our archaeological heritage includes all the material remains of past societies and cultures, uh, both above and below the ground. And it may be preserved in peat or in soil um, and also underwater. The island of Ireland uh, has about 138,000 recorded like. <laughs> monuments. A, um, the yeah recorded archaeological monuments and there is about twelve and a half thousand of these recorded monuments in the county of Galway so anyone that's not familiar this is a map of Ireland showing all the church sites that are recorded monuments in the county of Galway as you can see it's in the west of the country and there's yeah there's about over 400 church church sites which are recorded here in Galway 
Um, so the Galway Community Archaeologist, um, I work as a link with custodians and various government departments. I'm available to answer calls, emails, general queries from the public, and I can put people in the right direction. Um, I can take away the, the fear factor or the red tape that can be associated with our archaeological sites and their preservation and promotion. Um, I work to forge partnerships within communities, schools, colleges, landowners, farming groups, National Monument Service, um, museums and local the local authority here. Um, I can give I do uh, I, I give advice on funding and I also assist groups with um, applications for funding. And I help in promoting best heritage practice, uh, creating awareness and appreciation. Um, so that can be through, say, Heritage Week events, seminars, webinars, talks in the community. So over the past three years, um, we've supported over 70 individuals, groups and societies throughout, throughout the country. So funding encourages further public contribution and care and maintenance, and it can create awareness, appreciation, pride of place and further voluntary services within the communities. So thanks to ICANN, the Irish Community Archive Network, we have this platform to showcase our work and it's a go to stop shop, I suppose, for anyone seeking advice on their archaeological heritage. Um, we have we have uh, within one of our categories our publications and uh, we we basically put a, a lot of advisory material there that from from different uh, the from Galway County Council, the National Monument Service, the Heritage Council, the Office of Public Works, the and the National Museum of Ireland. So the website also assists in the promotion and creating awareness of our archaeological heritage. So um, for, for example, in Heritage Week, we can make short films and advisory videos. We work with communities and heritage groups and in, within their individual projects. For example, the Galway Forge Gates project is a recent one, and we highlighted the, the importance of metalworking within our archaeological record and the blacksmith trade markings on headstones and ironwork in graveyards. The Dini Ogazach project was which was showcased in Galway during the 2022 conference. Um, featured the Moyarwood Spearhead, um, a gentleman who found it in the 1940s, was reunited with it thanks to Woodlawn Heritage Group, the University of Galway and the National Museum of Ireland. So I worked as a link, um, helping to bring the artifact back to, to the community for this brief moment. And in doing that, you know, I was able to highlight the importance of reporting stray finds. So I'm available to assist groups and individuals in sourcing funding for projects um, associated with archaeological sites and monuments. So I would visit a site, I'd advise on how the community can go about their proposed project, uh, which stream of funding might be suitable. Um, here in Ireland, we're really fortunate um, that our archaeological heritage is recognised as a valuable resource. And now funding is available to communities and custodians of archaeological sites and monuments through the Heritage Council and the Community Monuments Fund, which is delivered by the National Monuments Service, uh, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So I also give advice on any permissions that may be required prior to works. So for example, perhaps uh, they would need written consent from a landowner and or the monument owner, or even sometimes it's just about finding out who the owner is. Um, ministerial consent may be required. Uh, you need to give notification of any works to the National Monument Service. Uh, you need to give them about two months notice. Um, I can help in the preparation of a method statement prior to works. Um, I can advise on whether archaeological licensing is required. Maybe there's ecological advice required and as well, the perhaps a conservation architect could be required. Um, 
so the community monuments fund just for example um it's been a massive contribution to the maintenance of sites and monuments throughout the country so here in galway we've been really successful seeing funding grow year on year um this project uh at abbey gormican so the preparation of a conservation management plan and essential works in removal of ivy and then work in its conservation to withstand future weather events and climate change. So this year we're going to be concentrating on signage, interpretation and accessibility. And this is, I hope this will work now, this is just a short um, 3D photogrammetry was used um, in recording the works uh, at this site in Abbey Gormican. And um, this gives you kind of a bird's eye view of a little transept chapel that's associated with a medieval abbey in the east of County Galway. And it just gives you an idea of how we can make these, these sites more accessible to, to, to everybody. Um, the Old Tomb Society created a 3D photogrammetry of the Romanesque chancel arch, um, a high cross and other medieval features in St. Mary's Cathedral in Tum. This was also through the Community Monuments Fund. And this is now available to view online, making it accessible to a worldwide audience and students and scholars with an interest in architecture, art, art history um, and archaeology. And this is just to give you an idea of one of the one of the pillar stones here. I'll just point to this point here. This is this lad here. Uh, Milltown Heritage Group, who are also within the Irish Community Archive Network, assisted a landowner with the preservation of his of a, this tower house. It was a bardic school. And it was a privately owned site. So the University of Galway was initially involved with the recording of the site. And then the Community Monuments Fund assisted in making it stable. So this is work in progress. And we'll be working with the community group and the landowner again in the next phase of works. So there's a distinct vulnerability of our lesser known sites or sites that are yet to be recorded. And Killiney or Children's Burial Grounds are one of one such site. And I can work with communities and getting relevant permissions to clear or tidy these sites and highlight their existence. So um, I, I can work, um, so, sorry, pardon. Yeah, so um, I can work with communities in getting relevant permissions to clear or tidy the sites and uh, it can help to record them and put them onto our archaeological record. So here um, in Park and Hour, I worked with, uh, we worked with local ecologist, a uh, community group uh, in the clearance of two forgotten children's burial grounds. And this is where the Mehel really came into force. Um, I was able to help with the permissions and monitor the works, inform the relevant agencies of the works. And over two days on, over, on two sites, uh, 15 people got together and gave their energy and enthusiasm. So, um, so I basically supported about 150 hours of voluntary work on that occasion. And uh, this will now, these sites will now continue to be, you know, looked after by the community. And that is really what the, the Mehill is all about, really. Um, so thanks to everybody for listening. Um, here's a few links that may be useful. I know Audrey will have them and I'll let you grab a cup of tea now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, what I might do, actually, because we're running a little bit behind time, because we were only having a five minute break, 
is if we just kept going, um, if that was okay for everyone. Um, uh, I hope that is. I think the, the BSL interpreters, Yvonne and Jackie, are saying, yep, that's a good one. Um, and we will get the questions. Uh, member to use the chat room to ask any questions. We can do it for you if you don't want to ask your own questions or one of the BSL interpreters can do it. But I think we'll just um, crack on um, and hear from Linda Fitzpatrick. She is the head curator at the Scottish Fisheries Museum Fife, and she's really going to give you an overview of Fishnet, a digitization project which was funded by the Museum Association Digital Innovation and Engagement Fund in 2021. Um, and really it was with the help and commitment of volunteers from across Scotland and beyond uh, that Fishnet was enabled the museum to share its huge, huge collection of archive images, um, which are of national significance. Um, and they are available online in a database. So let's hear more from Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Audrey. Um, and yes, uh, welcome to Fishnet. Um, which was funded by um, the Museums Association um, with additional support from Fife Settlement Fund to run for a year from October 2021 to 2022. Um, and although this was the culmination of our uh, attempt to get our photographs online, it came out of many, many years of work from our staff and volunteers to digitise and publish the archive. Um, which we were very, very happy, happy to receive a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund during COVID to actually get the, the last batch of the negatives digitised, um, but crucially not annotated or catalogued. So this was what Fishnet um, sought to do. So my slides are not moving. Hang on a second. There we go. Um, so the project aims were threefold. Um, we wanted to, as I said, publish our archive online so that everybody could access them. We wanted to engage volunteers, particularly remotely, um, because coming out of COVID, we all knew how difficult it had been to get people on site with collections so, and how much of an appetite there was for working online. Um, and we also wanted to support a wider public engagement program. So to do these things, we applied for the funding and got our, our funding and employed a project officer, Anna Grubenyuk, who collaborated with the existing staff and volunteers to achieve these three outcomes. So I'm going to just go through them one by one. Um, so the first and key outcome was to actually create a digital pl platform to host our images online. So the focus at the start of the project was to scope out and identify a platform or a platforms that would enable us to do all the various things that we wanted to do. Um, after detailed research, we identified a company called iBase as the most compatible with our existing systems, um, with our, our long-term aims and with our future resources to maintain the database after the end of the project. iBase were great. We were able to work closely with them to create a bespoke system that, as well as complying with museum standards for documentation, it suited our needs for searchability, for volunteer engagement, for public comment and for e-commerce. Um, crucially, iPACE were also able to capture the data in our existing on-site database, um, which meant that obviously the years and years of previous work wasn't lost. Um, however, this plugin, it added to the, the complexity of the, the database, so it did add to the cost as well, which is where the additional funding from Fife Settlement Fund came in really, really handy. The transfer of the data from our existing database to the new system also threw up various challenges. So we had to work through those as a team and figure out how best to secure the, the long-term future of the collection. So this is an example of one of the, the records, which is 
marked as incomplete, which has been has carried over some of the, the information from the previous um, database. And over the course of the project, 18,000 images image files were uploaded to iBase. 3,000 of them already had information, yeah. captions and keywords. So that enabled us to get the site live really quickly once we'd got all the, the technical side of it um, sorted out. A further 2,000 were completed and published during the course of the project. Yeah. Um, and the rest are still sitting in the system behind the scenes like this one. Um, for working on by volunteers. And so far it's been robust and it's working really well. Um, and cr critically, critically for us, um, our budgets are not large. So one of the things that attracted us to iBase and to this system was that we were able to pay a one-off fee. And as long as there's no issues or ongoing kind of troubleshooting or whatever, there's not, there's not an annual license to pay. So apart from the, the cost of the hosting, um, it makes it makes it quite a sustainable option for the museum to to keep it going for future years. So the second strand we had was to to work with volunteers, and we were really really pleased how how well this worked. Um, it started off rather slowly than we'd we'd anticipated because we took that extra time to select and build and customize the system, and um, that delayed our online recruitment. In the interim, existing volunteers worked away to help with the commissioning process. They put in their um, experience and we benefited from that while we were getting the new system ready. They completed preparatory tasks like photographing our indexes so that we could then upload them to the system so that they could be accessed remotely. Um, once the database was operational, we recruited a couple of new volunteers to test our systems and procedures supported by the project officer so that we could make sure that the help notes were working well and that everything was working properly before we rolled it out more broadly. And then we advertised the, the volunteering roles to, to the wider volunteer community. Um, Recruits were provided with a suite of resources, and here's some examples, um, again, created by our project officer. So we've got screen grabs and how to's and kind of examples of this is what a good one looks like, and um, there are videos. Um, in response to a member, of, of advice from a member of the Muse Museums Association Collections Network, we set up a private Facebook group for the volunteers so that they could swap tips amongst themselves and, and share advice if they wanted to. Um, and over the course of the project, we recruited 17 remote volunteers um, and a further nine have, fin have, start have, have joined us since the project finished. Um, and the volunteers have various reasons for, for volunteering. They include to improve their skills, to enhance employability, to support the museum, to support their own mental health and well-being. Um, and while the vast majority of the volunteers were based across Scotland, we've also attracted volunteers based in England and in the USA. Um, and that just gives you a little bit of a breakdown of our, of our volunteers. Um, interestingly, the age profile of these volunteers is very different from our previous volunteering programmes, with people under 30 making up over half of those participating. And this was our target. So this was really, really, um, we were delighted by that. Um, school pupils um, and those in full or part-time employment feature particularly highly. And I think that reflects the fact that this opportunity can be fitted around normal life. You can do it, you know, an hour in the evening or at the weekend. And it can also be um, done where if you're, you know, in a Far away location or a rural location you don't have to travel to get to, the, to this opportunity so people can fit it around their schedules so that was really really interesting to find out um our third strand was public engagement and for this we really wanted to have a mixture of on-site and online um activity because not everybody wants to be online all of the time and Despite the digital focus of the project, we were mindful of the need to reach audiences who were returning to the museum post COVID and to provide something that was actually on site and physical for them. So we had a, a public exhibition 
featuring local scenes. Um, we invited viewers to visit those places themselves via a town trail. And the, we had the exhibition open in two venues. Um, it was invited to another, another venue and around 1400 visitors um, attended that over, over the, the course of the, the exhibition. Um, we also used the project as the theme for our annual school's art competition, which was great. And we've got hundreds of entries from across Fife. And we did do online activity as well. So we had a, a weekly Photo Friday post across Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And they consistently reached over 2000 people and um, specific posts reached over 10,000 people. And the subjects really varied from um, topics relating to external events like COP26, the Environment Summit was, was happening at the time. Um, some of them sparked quite heated debates. Some of them others provoked reminiscences. Others meant that we could add new information to the database. So that was really useful. Um, further to this planned activity that was in the project plan, we were also able to respond to um, other collaborations and partnerships. So we worked with, for example, students from Aberty University who were creating an interactive um, game based on the lives of herring lasses. And then we also worked to support a PhD student from um, Spain who was looking into gender roles in the fishing industry. And she was really benefited from the search capabilities of the new database, which this is a, a just an example of um, on the screen at the moment. Um, so some of the impacts and the lessons that we learned from the project. Well, the most, most important and obvious impact of the project is the successful creation and publication online of our photographs. Um, as, a, a resource, as a resource, it's so useful, um, both internally and externally. It's reflected in the increasing efficiency in responding to our inquiries. Uh, we can use it for exhibitions inside and also we're getting lots of comments back from the public. We were also able to reach out to younger volunteers and to experienced fishermen. So we've got two or three ex-fishermen amongst our volunteer cohort and they are fantastic as, at being critical friends to comment on the images, adding richness to our records. Um, and we've also supported a number of school pupils, as I said, particularly completing their Duke of Edinburgh volunteering awards. So throughout the project, we've achieved all the aims that we set, set out to do, albeit some of them a little bit more slowly than others, and some of them by kind of a little bit of a roundabout route um, and with an additional cost to, to the start. Um, in the process, we learned that it was critical to ask questions of the people that we were working with to make sure that we got what we wanted and not to under, assume that they understood what we needed when we talked about the database. Um, and to ask questions of our volunteers as well and learn from their experience of working with our collection. And we prioritised the project legacy right from the start and making a building a system that was going to work for us, not in just trying to rush through and get as many object, uh, photographs and, and let records online as possible, but to actually build a system that was going to work in the long term. So it's a really positive legacy to this project. And although the funded project has finished, the, the, the actual work continues behind the scenes. The, the database is still online and it's growing. And if anybody wants to come and join us, then you'd be more than welcome. Um, head over to the site and you can um, yeah, get in touch and we'll welcome you on board. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Linda. Ooh. Thank you, Linda. That is very interesting. And I, I, I've put quite a few comments um, and questions in the chat room for you. So have a think about that. And there's Lorna giving you a clap as well. Really interesting um, about the sort of diversity of volunteers and what you're achieving um, as well. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next speaker because we can ask Linda lots of questions later. This is our final speaker. This is Hazel Morrison from Moy Cullen Heritage Group, who were the overall winners and received a, a very nice award at the 
Galway Conference. And he um, Hazel's going to talk about the group's work of researching and recording, preserving and sharing the history and the heritage of their locality. Um, they have created this massive uh, village uh, family tree with over 11,000 names in it, which I can't quite get my head around, Hazel. So hopefully you can explain that in the next few slides. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, uh, and hello to everybody. Uh, as, as Audrey said, my name is Hazel Morrison, and I am a member of My Cullen Heritage. Uh, or to give it its uh, full name, we are actually Common Stara Rurio Flartha Mokullin. So for those of you who are, are outside Ireland, uh, Common Stara is the Irish for History Society. And uh, Rurio Flartha uh, was a renowned and internationally recognised historian and antiquarian who was born in Moycollin actually in uh, 1629. And then Mokullin is actually the Irish for Moycollin. Uh, so we're a Gwaetuk village and we're on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, Bernie Doherty showed you lots of yellow circles on the, the west coast of Ireland there a few moments ago. So you'll have some idea where we are. Uh, we're 10 kilometres from the city of Galway and we are situated between Loch Arab and the Atlantic Ocean. So our parish spans 56 square miles or over 35,800 acres, would you believe? And we have 76 townlands, so quite a, an expansive area. Uh, I'm saying that our population is only really in the region of 2,000 people, uh, which is far short of pre-famine figures. Uh, in the 1840s, our village had approximately 4,800 people living there. So the area is predominantly farming and has over the years seen much immigration. So therefore, our, our diaspora are very important to us. Hey, so can I yeah. ask you? Are you going to share your screen? I am, yeah. It's coming up now in a minute. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I just wanted to say that uh, some of you would have visited our area uh, last year for the CAJ conference. And we thank you very much for uh, selecting our group as one of the ones you wanted to hear more about. So I will actually start um, with the uh, presentation, which uh, actually won us the award. Uh, and that is... Oh, where am I gone? I have to go back this way now. <laughs> uh, so this is the um, this is the shot that actually won us the the um, the place to present at this evening's webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, so in the centre you'll see our logo, and the faces you see around it are actually our uh, our group's members. So the group was started in 1995 uh, with the aim of researching, recording, preserving, and sharing the tangible and the intangible uh, history and heritage of our area, uh, of its people. Uh, and this covers built heritage, natural heritage, written and oral heritage. Uh, we're a group that doesn't actually have a physical home as such. We don't have a physical space, a building or a heritage centre. So we were very fortunate to have the support of Galway Community Heritage and the Irish Community Archive Network, who Bernie also referred to area, earlier. And they really gave us a home. And this was by way of an online platform, a website, uh, where we could store and share our research. So uh, I suppose really we spread the story of our heritage um, it went from local insular to, to accessible worldwide, really. So, uh, as I said, the faces around the uh, the screen here are our members. Uh, we're about 14 in total. Um, and that's the, um, the group that manage the activities. But we have other people that take uh, an interest on an as, as needs be. So some people just take part uh, in an area of projects that they have an interest in. So since COVID, uh, we've all learned to become hybrid in our approach. So uh, it has worked in our favour because uh, our diaspora now attend our meetings. And uh, we've discovered firsthand that you don't physically need to be in a community to be a large part of it. So one of our very hard working, uh, active managing volunteers lives in San Jose in California. 
And uh, another uh, collaborator um, lives in Melbourne in Australia, and she's currently uh, liaising with our committee on an upcoming project for October. So you can utilise the skills of these lovely people uh, outside of our, our communities, so uh, you don't always have to, to find them at home. Uh, so a day in the life of my Colin Heritage can be very varied. Um, we uh, get queries from local landowners about structures on their properties. We get requests from local students for assistance with school history projects. Uh, we meet and greet diaspora when they're returning to their roots. Uh, and of course, we're always researching and writing material for our website. Uh, in the photo here, this, this was a query we received one day. Uh, so you can see sometimes the spaces we have to crawl into aren't always the nicest, but uh, we pass these over to Bernie Doherty then so she can, uh, she can have them preserved and uh, fill in all the details. Uh, one of the projects we're working at at the moment was telling the story of um, a primary school in Wycullen, a very small primary school. And we discovered recently it actually produced three Olympians. Uh, you can see our latest Olympian there on the left of your screen. Um, and these three of the three Olympians, two of them actually won medals, uh, one silver and one bronze. So we're recording their, their history at the moment. Uh, we have worked on a few occasions with journalists uh, in the recording of material for TV. Uh, you can see one of our members there on the right uh, recording with RTE. And... Uh, Sometimes you will see us rooting in the undergrowth uh, for Ringford walls or up on the hills, um, examining old bur uh, burial sites. And uh, sometimes you'll see us um, viewing old settlements in the landscape. And sometimes you will see us in the high heels at uh, award ceremonies, which we're very proud of. Um, and the top right hand corner there was when we won uh, a cash award in Glasgow some years ago, which we're very proud of. So, but coming back to our archives, um, we are really trying to vary our recording methodology. Uh, so our archives can be multifaceted. So some are digitized and searchable documents, and some are oral recordings, some are visual, and even some living archives. So this evening, I'll just touch very briefly on some of them, uh, starting with our oral histories. Uh, our Shinshkelele, which uh, translates into, that's another story, uh, is an oral history project aiming to record the fullest possible picture uh, of olden times in Mycullen uh, by the residents in their own words. So it's an ongoing project uh, carried out with uh, a local community group, Mycullen Active Retired. So we record face-to-face -face interviews and also video recording with the willing participants. Uh, so the, the material really is a, a valuable permanent public reference resource. So currently we have 34 interviews um, that are currently being uh, transcribed. They were originally put onto these CDs and DVDs that you see in the in the photo here. But, you know, life has moved on. Uh, and actually, even this evening, it really brought it home to me when I'm uh, sharing the, the platform here with the Scottish Deaf Archives that, you know, it really made me think about how important this transcribing actually is. So it enables us to keep uh, our heritage all inclusive and, you know, available for everybody. Uh, another project is uh, it's a reference type archive. Uh, in 2014, my Colin Heritage erected a commemoration stone uh, to honour all those men and women from the Mycullen area who served or died in past wars or on service with the United Nations. So three commemoration lists were also compiled, which you can see here. Uh, as well as being on public display locally, uh, they're posted on our website. And the lists, as you'll see, are men from my Colin who died in past wars, uh, people who were veterans of wars and armies, and the men and women who were involved or were victim, uh, victims of Ireland's uh, struggle for independence between 1916 and 1923. So uh, we hold an annual um remembrance ceremony at this stone and each November we find more and more people are coming forward with additional names to add to the 
the veterans uh, list. So really by creating awareness, we are uh, by default creating a more accurate archive. Uh, our next archive uh, is a living archive, really. We like to think of it as living archive. Um, one way to capture uh, living heritage was to highlight the biodiversity within our area. So in 2016, we launched our first heritage trail. So and in a few weeks time, we'll actually be launching our sixth trail. So as well as geology and and the ecology of my column, uh, the trails cover built heritage and the heritage of people. Uh, the trails are, again, um, developed in collaboration with another community group, which is the My Column Walking Club. And they are accredited by Sport Ireland and included in the National Trails Register. All of the trails, uh, bar one woodland section of one of the trails, are on public roads and are suitable for all levels of walker and cyclist. And they vary in distance from uh, three kilometres to 23 kilometres. Uh, they have signs placed um, at or near places of interest and coloured way markers uh, along the routes. Make sure you don't get lost. Uh, our Esker Trail is essentially a, a fossilised river dating back 20,000 years. And our Rocks Road uh, Trail is a karst limestone uh, pavement, also linking back to the uh, Ice Age movement. Um, and our Boggs Trail uh, takes you through a national heritage site. So um, the Living Archives, uh, the Living Archive of our Heritage Trails is really playing a large part in community efforts around the concept of health and well-being. Uh, our next um, archive, again, Bernie touched on this earlier and she was a lot braver than I am. Uh, she put in uh, active links. Um, my links in the middle are a bit static, but uh, you can go into our website and you can see these 3D um, these 3D versions of uh, the photographs. So, um, with this, uh, you know, I referred to earlier to our um, our group not having a physical space, so we're not in a position to accept any physical artifacts. So to compensate for this uh, and to ensure that the story of, of these items aren't lost, we've adopted um, the alternative of having, where possible, uh, the items 3D scanned. So our local heritage office um the a local heritage officer and Galway Community Heritage provided training uh, or upskilling uh, in the field of photogrammetry. Uh, it can be a slow process, and I think some of us were very slow to cop on to it and how to, to manage it, but um, we're eventually getting there. So um, it can be very rewarding, though, when you can actually, you know, play around with these, turn them upside down and inside out. Uh, so it's like you physically have them in your hand. So. Um, as I said, you can go into our website. You see two here. One was uh, on the left. It was uh, a gentleman who contacted us. He had found this stone on his land. So we were able to get it uh, recorded. And you'll see the 3D version in the middle. And likewise, again, another query from uh, somebody in our locality found this stone in their garden. And it turned out to be a quern stone. So that has subsequently gone to the National Museum. Uh, but we have it, as I said, on our website. So it, it, it keeps the details locally. Uh, our next archive uh, is an experimental archaeolog archaeological archive. Uh, so we were in delighted to be invited by the Palace Boy Project to collaborate on this um, experimental archaeological undertaking. And in this case, it was uh, an original log boat uh, called the Lees Island Five Log Boat. Uh, and it has survived under the waters of Loch Harab at Knock Ferry near Moyconnen for over 2,400 years. So it was, of course, too expensive to raise. So the underwater archaeological, how can I say the word, archaeological, uh, team from the National Monument Service recorded the vessel in situ. Uh, and then the Palace Point project worked from these recorded notes uh, to rec recreate a replica of the boat. So I suppose experimental archaeology uh, tells us uh, what materials and tools 
were used to craft prehistoric wooden uh, artifacts. But this project actually relived the experience um, or the processes of crafting. Uh, a blog and a video recorded each step of the journey, um, starting with the difficulties of sourcing a seven metre long tree to, to recreate the boat. And uh, through the, the months of uh, the crafting of the boat, right down to further difficulties of how to move a two ton boat uh, back onto the water at Knock Ferry. Um, so uh, at one stage, actually, it was suggested that the original might have, in fact, uh, been designed to be a votive offering and that it could have been crafted with the sole purpose of sinking. So uh, we made the decision to keep going with the project and stick to the archaeologists' uh, recorded notes. Um, so we didn't want to see the, the hard work slip away below the water, really, on the maiden voyage. But um, on the launch day, it created much excitement. There was hundreds along the piers, you know, would it sink, would it float? Uh, so it turned out that it floated. So it was fantastic. You can see uh, a gentleman paddling away. Uh, so um, we had Shano singer Sorka de Rocha. She composed a really haunting tune, actually, to, to commemorate the event. And you, again, you can find all this information on our website under the Lees Island 5 log boat. Um, and then on to this uh, big family tree that Audrey referred to. Uh, the Mycollin genealogy uh, project was launched in 2021 with the purpose of uh, adding to the store of knowledge, really, of Mycollin's social history and to, to relink modern day Mycollin with its diaspora. So we used uh, as an anchor point for the project uh, the families that were recorded in a census, which was collated by a local parish priest. Uh, Father Francis Xavier Blake between the years of 1792 and 1813. So he was very forward thinking for his time. So a couple of years ago, we had actually digitized this census onto our website uh, in a, a searchable fashion so people could look for their ancestors. So we took this uh, census and um, we decided that we could build it in uh, because, you know, recently, in recent years, the pop popularity of um, at-home DNA testing had exploded around the world, really. So this allowed uh, uh, individuals to match and identify distant relations and uncover lost families. So through a GoFundMe page, uh, we garnered contributions uh, to purchase DNA tests and we used these um, families that we could identify back to the Blake census. They're still deep rooted in my column. So these families were, were DNA tested. Uh, they were offered free DNA kits. And uh, for each person then tested, a family tree was produced uh, using publicly available material. Um, and then after that, we used Facebook and our, our website and um, the trees that were created were shared. And on the Facebook page, people, um, sh they chatted about their DNA matches and related information. And the primary benefit of that group then has been to facilitate the comparison of the DNA results from my column people and the descendants with the descendants of my column diaspora. So through the, the groups, uh, lost family links have been re-established and this in turn has brought uh, new knowledge of the history of migration from Mycollin, which has been very interesting. Uh, as Lorna mentioned, uh, the or, or as Audrey mentioned, the, the, tree, the, the trees were co consolidated um, and now we have a big Mycollin parish tree, which has over 11,000 names on it. So now we've started into the analytical phase of this project um, and some of the topics um, that are coming out of this are very interesting. Uh, for example, surname spellings and variations. So the civil and church records for the last 230 years are written in English. But when these names of local white column people were given to the recorders, they were spoken in Irish. So some surnames were written as an attempted at phonetic spelling 
uh, of the Irish version rather than the translation in English. So, for example, one name, uh, Thornton, would be um, a, a popular name in my column. Uh, Thornton in Irish is Drynon. So on the old records, they were spelled D-R-Y-N-A-N-E, Drynane. So I don't think very many Thorntons would have been looking back over records looking for dry name. Uh, social customs was something else that um, the, the analysis of these, uh, the DNA results coming out. Um, marriages, um, many of them, over 80% of them, took place in the month of February. Uh, and this actually tied in with the local lore that uh, on a Friday nearest to the feast of St. Anya, uh, hordes would gather in a field uh, called Luganasa in Clunif for a harvest festival. And this was used in, as an opportunity to find a marriage partner. And if you were successful, uh, you would marry the following January or February. So we're now seeing that the records reflect this uh, folklore tale. Uh, people did get married in January and February. Um, the tree also reaffirmed that there were often marriages uh, between and among extended families. And in fact, some close family relationships, although allowed uh, by the church law, um, were donated, were uh, denoted throughout the Moycullen Parish records, uh, showing degrees of consanguinity. Uh, immigration patterns is also something that's very interesting, uh, which are coming out of this. Um, most people think when um, my column people uh, emigrated, they went to America and they went to New York and they went to Boston. Uh, these were major destinations for my column people, uh, but also people settled in, settled in smaller uh, metropolitan areas uh, and even rural farming areas. So we're finding Washington, D.C., Lots of my column names there in the 1850s and um, they were working on the employment and the construction of the Capitol building um, nearby Baltimore and Ohio road works, road works and the gas works in Foggy Bottom uh, part of the city. Kansas, uh, 1860s, the American frontier uh, was centred in the state of Kansas and it was to there that the northeastern part of the state that my column people found their way. Um, the farming community actually of St. Bridget, uh, we've discovered, uh, was actually founded by a boy Colin man called William Madden. So most Irish immigrants took up farming on tracts of land, which really uh, they could only dream of in Ireland. Uh, they had large tracts of land in, in Kansas. Uh, other areas, Ohio River Valley and Pittsburgh, but it, it's it's showing up um, statistics where like in the 1880s, um, you know, the the people that were emigrating, um, the earlier ones uh, were, you know, the earlier immigrants from Wycullen arrived as families with small children. But by the 1880s, it was actually single men and women who were leaving Wycullen. Um, and then, of course, we had Birmingham, London and Glasgow as well. Um, a lot of Wycullen people. Um, and again, it's, it's amazing what comes out of these. Um, we were looking at migration to my column um, and we were seeing many of them had originated from County Clare and um, the famous line to Heller to Connacht. And uh, a document came to, to light, um, which was created in 1905 in Washington. And it was a full pedigree chart uh, going back to 1654 of a family who left um, the south of Ireland and moved to Clare. And it even dated it back to 1728 coming to my column. Um, and then there's lovely little stories in it about um, the family being educated uh, in Guernsey in the 1700s. So, again, a lot of social history coming out. A lot of the people who came to my column, we are noticing can uh, trace their families back to either a Royal Irish Constabulary member or maybe a teacher who came to, to work in the area and then married and stayed. So this is um, kind of the the outputs of a DNA genealogy uh, project. Uh, so it's uh, combining the traditional elements of heritage, really the historical records, oral histories, and it's it's mixing it with the modern technology, so DNA testing and social media. So as a result, um, my Cullen Heritage have uh, really created bonds between the my Cullen people of today and the diaspora, the descendants of those that left our shores many, many moons ago. 
So it's really it's expanding the notion that heritage um, can use the, the latest technology as well uh, in, in recording our past. So uh, because of the result, um, lots of um, diaspora now have a better understanding of where their people came from and their roots. So I suppose it's a, it's a project that um, is replicable um, for other communities as well. They might not have a Father Blake census from the late 1700s to link back to, but it's always linkable to, you know, um, Griffith's valuation or, or even a census from 1901. So uh, that's our um, reference archive. So with time up, I hope I've given you a little bit of an insight into what my Colin Heritage do and uh, how we try and vary our archives um, and how we collate information. Um, our contact details are online there. And if anybody ever wants us at any stage, please feel free to drop us an email or a phone call. Um, we're, we're always available to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hazel, for that. I, I can't go over how much that you get all that you do having visited. Um, it is really a very rural place that you live, but there's so much going on. It's, it's incredible. Um, what I want to do, because we're running over time um, and there's I want to just ask if anybody wants to ask a question, if they can use the reaction at the bottom of the screen, which you can see reactions and you can raise your hand. And if you put your cameras on, I can see. And I might, um, if you want to either ask it yourself or if you would like to have BSL interpreter do it for you, just let us know because there are there were questions in the chat and what I'm going to suggest is um, if you have any questions for any of the speakers tonight then we will pass on your email uh, we will also share this recording with you and you will have all the links that have come up in the chat and all the links that maybe are in the people's slides as well so you'll have lots of information um, so I'm just looking, seeing if anyone is asking a question. No, I'm not seeing everyone. I'm not seeing anyone. I'm going to have to ask my own questions at the end, actually, because I had questions for all of you. And I don't think we have time because it's nearly eight o'clock. But I do want to say um, thank you very, very much to all of the speakers. That's Lillian Lawson, Bernie Doherty. Hazel Morrison and Linda Fitzpatrick. I'd also like to say very much a big thank you to the BSL interpreters, Yvonne Waddle and Jackie McDonald. I really hope that some of you will consider uh, submitting a digital poster for the next CASH conference, which is taking place in London on the 19th of July. I would just say keep an eye out on the website. And if you're on Twitter as well, um, our Instagram, it's at C archives we can put that into the chat room as well um, that's the best way to keep up to date with everything that we are doing if you have any suggestions of the sort of thing you would like us to do more of i'm thinking a webinar on volunteering would be really helpful but if there's anything else you can think of please do get in touch um, my email has been sent out with the eventbrite details and i can pass that on to the rest of the committee and I think Deborah's just popped it up in the chat room as well. So we really would love your input for future events. Do get in touch. But thanks very much for taking time out and coming along this evening. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye.